Good morning. My name is Enid Slack, and I'm the director of the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. On behalf of the board and the staff at IMFG, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's panel discussion on data dilemmas, municipalities, and smart city technology. Before we begin, I wish to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. I would like to thank the external funders of the Institute, Havana Capital, Maitri, the Neptis Foundation, the City of Toronto, the Region of Halton, and the Region of York. I would like to thank our team at IMFG for putting this event together today, Thomas and Piali. And I would also like to thank the events and technical staff at the Monk School, Daria and Adam. If you are tweeting about this event, our hashtag, as you can see here, is IMFG Talks, and our Twitter handle is at IMFG Toronto. Today is the second of three events that IMFG is hosting on the role of Canadian municipalities and technology and the use of data. Today, we're going to be talking about smart city technology. Our moderator for the series and for the panel discussion today is Dr. Zachary Spicer. Zach is an associate professor in the School of Public Policy and Administration at York University in Toronto. Before that, he was the Director of Research and Outreach at the Institute of Public Administration of Canada, IPAC. He has done many other things and has written widely, um, but I just wanted to add that uh, a number of years ago, Zach was a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute for Municipal Finance and Governance. His research focuses on local government and innovation policy in Canada. So Zach will tell you a bit more about the event series and about today's panel, uh, and he will also introduce the panel. Following uh, brief presentations from each of the panel members, Zach will engage in a discussion with them before turning to you, the audience, to ask some questions. You may ask your questions at any time during the panel discussion or after uh, using the Q&A function on Zoom at the bottom of your screen. So now over to you, Zach. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And of course, uh, thanks to Enid and the IMFG team for hosting today's event. This is the second of three events that the IMFG is putting on to explore how, how lo local governments are adopting new technology and reacting to emerging digital trends. We're interested in mapping out where the challenges lay in the months and years ahead and providing local leaders with the tools that they require in, uh, to, that they require in a digital era. And of course, with this being the, the IMFG, a special focus will be on the finance and governance of the policy and regulatory approaches that municipalities take. The first event focused on the platform economy. Many thanks to those who were able to actually join us that day, but if you, if you were not able to, a recording is available on the IMFG website. The final panel will be happening on March 1st, and it will be focused on cybersecurity. We are going to be assessing a range of different cyber threats and discussing steps that, that local governments can take to organize, uh, to, to, to keep their organizations and the public safe. Registration for that event is also available on the IMFG website. I'm, of course, very happy to be moderating all of these different conversations. So, as mentioned today, we're going to be focusing on smart city technology, data governance, and privacy. And when we think of smart cities, uh, many of us uh, in and around the greater Toronto area probably immediately think of things like Keyside, which was the Sidewalk Labs smart city project once planned for Toronto's waterfront. The whole development would have had technology infused throughout, making it more responsive to users. But this, however, prompted important questions about how this project was gathering and using data. Sidewalk Labs eventually moved on from the project and some of the attention on smart city technology and data governance left with it. 
while Keyside may have been a central focus in the, the debate about smart city technology for a while, many smaller scale projects are being implemented in local governments across Canada, albeit to much less attention. However, the same type of questions about data control and governance apply to these, pro these projects too, even if they don't come with the limelight that Keyside received. The scale of, this, of this, this adoption has led to a number of important questions about smart city technology. Namely, how are, are municipalities adopting this technology and for what purpose? Do they have the right tools to respond effectively to concerns about data governance and control? And what does the public need to know about how their data will be collected and used? Thankfully, we have a great panel with us to dive into these issues today. First, Natasha Tusikov is a assistant professor in the Department of Social Science at York University. Her, her research examines the, the intersection among law, crime, technology, and regulation. Cyrus Tarani is the chief digital officer and director of information for the city of Hamilton. And finally, Merlin Chatwin is the executive director of Open North, a nonprofit specializing in open data and open government community engagement, and open smart cities. If you're interested, a more fulsome biography of each is also available on the IMFG website. So each of our panelists uh, will, will begin today by sharing some brief thoughts about our topic. We'll get into a bit of a discussion with the panel and then open the floor up to your questions. So please feel free to write in any questions that you may have in the Q&A box. We will begin today from hearing, to, we will begin today by hearing from Natasha. Thanks, Zach. I'm really pleased to be here today to talk about smart cities and technology. I come to this issue as a researcher who focuses on regulation, and I have a research project that looks at the control over data in smart cities as a form of regulation. And I'm trying to answer questions like who owns and controls data, who sets rules governing data, and questions that would be particularly interesting for this audience. How does the collection and control of data affect public policy and affect government regulatory activities? I'm currently finishing a book on the economic and political changes to the global economy through the lens of the smart city, looking at the failed Sidewalk Labs project in Toronto. And the reason uh, that is the case study is because smart cities are the Rosetta Stone of the knowledge-driven global economy. The forces at play in the smart city are the same ones upending the global political economy. The importance placed on intellectual property, data collection and surveillance, and an often significant role for global tech companies. So today I wanna to make five points to kickstart discussion on smart cities and technology. So first, as we all know, data is the lifeblood of smart cities. It ensures the proper operation of these smart city technologies to make them real time, customizable. Control over data collection and interpretation is key to obtaining economic value. And this means that companies typically seek to retain proprietary control over data and they conceptualize data. They understand data as an asset. Now here data is protected by intellectual property laws, which enables companies to extract the value and control that value because those who own and control the data can undertake uh, proprietary data analytics. So proprietary control is prioritized over, often over other data governance frameworks, such as open data frameworks, where the data is publicly accessible for anyone to use. So who owns and controls smart city data is a central question. The public, however, may not understand this or not realize that data collected in public spaces might be under the control of governments or it might be under the control of privately operated tech companies. So given these systems of publicly and privately operated sensors and infrastructure in smart cities, the resulting data might be in partially or exclusively private control. Another set of questions relates to commercialization. Should or can any kind of data be off limits for commercialization? For example, some cities, especially in the United States, are banning the use of facial recognition software by police or by private firms. So the second question, how should smart data be governed? So since Sidewalk Labs, there's been an interest in um, data trusts to govern data. And in these trusts, some type of government agency or independent actor would store and grant access to data. And data trusts are intended to facilitate innovation, but also to protect privacy, to provide a level of data protection. 
But before considering data trusts or any kind of specific data governance mechanism, we should really step back and consider data collection more broadly. Instead of asking how to govern the data, we should ask, should it be collected in the first place? Is there any type of data we might consider off limits for government or for companies to collect or to commercialize? How do we balance principles of privacy uh, with innovation in the smart city? What actor or group of actors has the authority and legitimacy to store smart city data? A big question during the Keyside projects was, do we want the storage of data in Canada? If it can't be stored here, what type of data do we think should be collected? So this involves thinking about how we value data. And only after we've had some kind of discussion about how data is, uh, what data collection is acceptable, should we move on to thinking about how it should be governed. Now, smart cities are all about incorporating data into all aspects of cities, but since we have uh, what can be a private data infrastructure, this can disrupt the capacity of government officials to regulate city services. Now, in some cases, we are seeing municipal authorities losing access to formerly public or civic data, such as rental data, which is now captured by Airbnb. Both Air, uh, Vancouver and San Francisco have battled Airbnb in court over accessing its data for public policy reasons. How can cities set policies in areas such as traffic or housing without having access to data? It could mean that city residents end up paying for data that would otherwise be public. This can result in municipal authorities experiencing data deficits that limit their capacity for public planning and regulation. University of Ottawa law professor Teresa Scassa has a useful article exploring data deficits in public policy. And without access to this data, government officials could have a greatly limited regulatory capacity. So third, when we talk about smart cities and technology, we're talking about intellectual property. Who owns the intellectual property isn't a secondary question, it's a central question. For smart cities and intellectual property, we're largely talking about the control over patents, processes with technologies. We're also talking about copyright covering the software at the heart of these technologies, including algorithms. So intellectual property is the heart of knowledge-based economies, of data-based economies. Once you own the intellectual property that, op that operates the urban infrastructure, you have a significant capacity to control uh, the vast amounts of data. And the possession of key intellectual property can really set those actors, often private companies, up to receive licensing fees from anyone else who wants to use those protected ideas. This can mean that newcomers, smaller tech companies, uh, new tech companies, have to pay to play by licensing those patents. And incumbents receive rent through the licenses. So those who own the intellectual property can appropriate a lion's share of value in the global value chain. This means that control via intellectual property can really have uh, a, an impact on the economic and uh, social innovation, promoting certain paths of innovation, shutting others down. And with this IP dynamic, this is what some Canadian tech companies were concerned about over the Keyside project. There's a worry here that with uh, global companies moving in, that local firms will be relegated to writing code or selling technology to the big tech giants. So too, government has warned that Canada risks becoming, quote, a nation of data cows for other countries. And data cows, here is a useful metaphor, uh, resources to be sucked dry with little agency to fight this. So in this scenario, Canadians would have data extracted by globally operating tech firms. Rules would be set in other countries, largely the United States, and extend over Canadian firms and cities, uh, citizens. So what does consent look like in smart cities? These sensors that Zach talked about are uh, often hidden and uh, privacy laws require consent for the collection of personal data, but not non-personal data. But consent can be tricky as sensors might be embedded into infrastructure, hidden from ordinary view. And people can't consent if they don't understand what's collected or how the data might be combined to re-identify people from anonymized data. Another question is, what does opting out of data collection look like in a smart city? How can one refuse? If someone declines to give consent for the collection of data in public spaces, what are their options short of leaving the area in question? Another challenge is the increased blurring between personal and non-personal data. 
We can think of wastewater testing as an example here. This has become increasingly common in the COVID era for not only infectious diseases, but also illicit and illicit drugs. Wastewater testing can involve non-personal data, such as wastewater collected from a university dorm or a housing complex, but it can also involve personal data, wastewater that can be traced to a particular individual in a home. So most testing in this example is done by university researchers, but private companies are also entering the field. So as again, University of Law professor uh, Joyce Scassa notes, wastewater testing is an important and a really undergoverned area when we think about data collection and data privacy. So in conclusion, we can draw a few lessons for policymakers. One of the questions we should be considering is what do we want our cities to be? And who assumes the risk when we talk about smart city projects? Smart city technology vendors often talk about smart cities using the city as a platform metaphor, but cities aren't planned or run as for-profit platforms. Platforms are risky, platforms can fail. Cities have other values, other roles, rather than when, whether a project can turn a platform. A key question is who is responsible for the upkeep or the repair of smart cities? What happens if the technology fails? If the smart city providers go bankrupt or shift their business models away? Hardware and software comprising digital infrastructure is often proprietary to specific technology vendors. So cities can face additional challenges in changing or repairing digital infrastructure once it's installed. This requires then policymakers to have specialized expertise in issues of data collection, storage, use, and governance. Now, as policymakers, you may be more accustomed to procurement issues, but smart city technology also, as you know, requires expertise in privacy laws and data protection, and even familiarity with international trade agreements that set rules on data flows. Now, what are some of the best data governance frameworks for Canadian smart cities? This will vary by the city. But to determine how best to govern data, we have to think about what values we prioritize. Much of the discussion on smart cities focuses on innovation and rightly so, that's very important. We need to ensure that local tech firms have a place in smart cities, but we also need to ensure that smart cities are spaces of fairness, spaces of justice, spaces of equity. And as the Keyside project shows, there's a lot of public interest and public concern in data collection. Now, governments, talking in Canada here, are belatedly recognizing the importance of considering data protection. Governments at the uh, level of Ontario government and also federally are crafting data protection strategies. And uh, this is a vitally needed area. So in conclusion, I hope that this discussion uh, helps kickstart some debate, some discussion on smart city technologies. And I wanted to thank you. And there's a uh, resource PDF in the chat of a few uh, publications I thought would be of interest. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, there's a lot for us to uh, to consider there for sure, and I see we already have a couple of questions coming in. So you've definitely gotten uh, a bit of a uh, bit of discussion going. So thank you very much. Um, we'll now uh, turn to Cyrus for a couple of opening remarks. Thanks, Zachary. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. So I'm Cyrus Tranny. I'm the Chief Digital Officer for the City of Hamilton. Um, and I'm, I would probably put myself in the category of a smart city practitioner. So within my portfolio, I have uh, our sort of some of our smart city work, but I also have our open data portfolio and a, and a few other areas uh, as well as innovation. So I think, I think Natasha really helped provide like a broad overview. Um, if I can get a little bit more granular, I would say that, you know, as we look at the evolution of smart city technology, right, there's been this sort of you know, if you look at the history of it, it, it really was a marketing term that was developed to sell solutions. Uh, and if you look at the evolution of smart cities, one, two, three, four, you know, it, it's really shifting now, I think, to how can um, technology be used to augment service delivery or improve um, the experience of the resident or provide for more wholesome um, sort of experiences as, as a resident. And it's moving away maybe a little bit more from that all-encompassing you know technology platform which was you know very prevalent with the way that um, Google and Alphabet were looking at, at presenting it and I would say that um, I think understanding and at a city and a municipal level around some of these complexities is really at the at the forefront of 
many of those discussions. Uh, and it was, in some ways, I think it was a, a watershed moment for people to understand some of these technologies. And maybe if you don't need to even understand the technology, but what does data and the value of data bring? And how can you use data for good without tripping into some of these complexities around third-party data ownership, um, you know, and thinking about things like privacy by design, policies and procedures that need to be in place. And, and, I, and I would say that um, from my experience, at least at a municipal level, this, this larger all-encompassing, you know, tech revolution is still um, not the reality. It, it still has a long way to go. And a lot of where you see the evolution of, let's call it smart technology and, and data is really about trying to understand the data that cities already have. The cities tend to be very um, data rich, but information poor. So it's about how to take that stuff and evolve it to another level that it can be used to support the service delivery uh, models at a, uh, a city. So, you know, not, I think all smart technologies we need to keep in mind may relate to, you know, surveillance technologies or IoT technologies that are capturing uh, PI or these multifaceted systems that integrate multiple data points into a common solution that's, you know, monitoring or using for um, operations. I, I think it's a much uh, simpler scope currently, at least from, from my experience. But I think these topics that were, were raised are, are things that are on the radar and people really need to consider uh, as this technology and the pace of technology evolution and innovation uh, evolves. And, and happy to kind of, you know, continue that discussion as we get into the panel a little bit more. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Um, and uh, finally, we will hear from uh, from from Merlin, and then I have a couple of questions um, for the panel. Thank you, uh, and, and thanks again for this opportunity. Um, I appreciate the blend of the perspectives on the panel, uh, from the uh, academic to the practitioner, and, and a lot of what I have to say is is a repeat of, of what uh, Natasha and Cyrus, so I can hopefully keep my comments brief, um, although that's not my strong point. Um, the, the comments from Cyrus really resonate around the sort of uh, there's this IoT and the surveillance, and these are all the, the sort of cutting edge frontier technology um, is, is not really our lived reality in Canada yet. Uh, it, it exists and there's discussions on it, but the, from the work that we do with, um, with communities across Canada, it, it's really about the, the existing data and the, the collaborations and, and the cities not having uh, ownership and, and sometimes access to the data that they need um, and then figuring out how best to to create these relationships with with private sector who own the data or or non-governmental who who own the data that sits outside of of this of the city um, so and just to situate my experience a bit is uh, open north canadian ngo um, working at the intersection of data and technology and civic challenges um, we work both in the research and practical application space. So I would put myself in the middle of, of Natasha and Cyrus as like an academic practitioner. And we, we contributed to this concept of an open smart city in 2018 um, as an alternative to the, the emerging sort of private sector dominated vision of smart cities uh, that we see across the US. And the, the idea of an open smart city is a place where residents and civil society, academics, private sector, um, I'll collaborate with public officials and it's to use technology in a way that is appropriate um, and not reaching for the, the shiny new thing, but, but trying to solve a particular problem in a way that is uh, representative of the common good um, and, and sort of reflective of a values led approach. And so this, you know, we, we apply this concept um, in a variety of ways, but direct support to communities across Canada. Um, we're the, the lead technical partner for the Community Solutions Network, which is a, an Infrastructure Canada funded um, support program uh, in partnership with Evergreen. Um, and, and we work with municipal staff across Canada to, who, are, who are looking to adopt um, data and technology in different ways. Um, and our focus are, are topics in, in many of these that we've discussed around privacy, security, opening and sharing data, data governance, uh, public engagement and then what we've seen and um, 
where the work gets really interesting is when we're applying these domains to really specific and tangible problems. So climate change, homelessness, digital divide, when, we've, when we're centering uh, an actual problem and, and then looking at what are the, the data and technology solutions that are appropriate there. Um, and so then just a couple of challenges that we've come across, uh, and again, reflecting a lot of the comments um, from Cyrus and Natasha, there's, a, there's an issue of, of capacity constraints. And by capacity, I mean like, uh, and Natasha stated this, is that privacy and security is a specialized area of knowledge. Um, platform development, coding is a specialized area of knowledge. User research is a specialized area of knowledge, data science. Uh, and these aren't positions that have typically been within communities at the local government level. And so then there's this, um, there's this conundrum of, are you to hire for these positions and create these digital teams um, or, or are you going to uh, contract up? And, and there's this creative tension for a lot of these digital and technology decisions because um, the, the sort of capacity and, and experience deficits that you have within cities that are causing cities to want to contract for uh, external service providers or external platforms are the same deficits that make that procurement risky because uh, the experience of, of procuring um, and understanding uh, how to get um, platforms that are that are modular and 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 how the data data ownership works um, for for the data collected from the platforms. And so there's there's a real yeah there's a real tension of um, how much investment is, is required in order to build that capacity either to procure or to develop in house. It's that tension between in sourcing and outsourcing. Um, <clears throat> and then I think the second thing I, I highlight is that the importance of data governance I don't think is is really well understood yet. Um, we see a lot of focus on the solutions, um, looking at governments wanting open data portals, they need to increase data literacy, need a strategy. But the the importance of, of uh, building that within a data governance strategy um, and, and for cities to get access to um, and or control over data that is necessary uh, for the functioning and for service delivery um, is not really well understood. And we have a number of examples around uh, how that um, becomes like a secondary consideration um, within cities as they're trying to solve particular problems and going deep into the strategy. And then all of a sudden, the, the consideration of data governance comes up. Now, I'll, I'll leave it at that so we can move on to, to questions. Awesome, thank you, Merlin. Um, so I think all three of you have given um, our, our audience a lot to think about. We have a lot of questions coming in. I have a couple myself that I'm just gonna lead off with that if, if that's okay. And I'll put the first one uh, to Natasha, if you don't mind. Um, you, you touched on privacy here and, and a, a key component in most discussions about smart city technology and data governance is privacy. There's you know, rightfully uh, a, a lot of concern about how people's data would be used by these smart systems. Part of this, however, uh, involves the public knowing and I suppose uh, caring about how their data is actually collected and used. How aware do you feel the public is about data governance and privacy and what can we do better to inform the public about data protection and data governance when it comes to smart city technology? Yeah, this is a great question and a, a serious problem. Uh, certainly we can look to a number of surveys in the United States and Canada that show Canadians and Americans are very concerned, especially about uh, companies collecting their data. So there is concern. There's also feelings of helplessness. Um, you know, how do you move away from using certain technologies even if you're concerned about the data that's being collected? For the Canadian context, and especially for smart cities, there was a survey by uh, out of McMaster University by two researchers uh, led by Sarah Bannerman, Professor Bannerman, that really identified, yes, people are concerned about data collection in smart cities, especially when it's personally identifiable information, and especially when companies may use that information and then monetize it, right? So uh, somehow delivering advertising to those people. But also, um, people were more 
willing to have governments use their information, but not law enforcement agencies. So when we think about people's um, ease of or at comfort with having governments use their data for planning purposes, for policy purposes, not all government departments are the same. And there's quite a bit of concern about how law enforcement uses uh, people's, people's data. In terms of knowledge, this is really a, a key area. I'm not exactly sure what to do about it. Certainly, uh, you know, governments at, at all levels um, need to improve people's data literacy. But I'd also argue that many policymakers, you know, would, would need greater training in this area too. I spend a lot of time speaking with, with policymakers or writing policy briefs, and that's something that comes up again and again and again. I would just say that I think the pandemic sensitized some people about data collection, specifically, you know, in the area of COVID tracking apps. I think a lot more people are aware that it's two companies, Google and Apple, that control these, you know, these app stores and also the operating system. So I think there's a, the pandemic's made people a little more knowledgeable uh, or maybe critical about some monopoly practices, but in terms of broad data, data literacy, we have a long way to go. Excellent, thank you. And um, if I could uh, flip this question around a bit and uh, pose it to pose it to Cyrus and um, think a little bit about government capacity in relation to some of these issues. Um, Cyrus, we, we rely on government uh, to think through a lot of these issues around privacy and data governance for us as well, right? There's an expectation that, um, that smart systems are implemented and adopted with public protection in mind. Uh, as we've seen, uh, is a fast moving, fairly highly technical policy space. Do municipalities have the capacity and resources to think through a lot of the issues around data governance and privacy? And if not, what will it take to increase some of this capacity? So yeah, I think, you know, first of all, it obviously is gonna depend on the municipality, right? Like there's, I think there's something like 444 different government municipalities, cities, regions in, in Ontario alone Right, so it, it does, I think, you know, you have to think about the context of um, what type of staffing is available based on the size of the municipality. But I, I do think there is in general, um, and again, I can only put in the context of what I'm familiar with for, you know, Hamilton being sort of ninth or 10th largest region in, in, in Hamilton and, and the size of the staff that we have, but the other colleagues that I interact with on the smart city uh, front, um, even from smaller communities, this is, is really front and center, like people, do you think about this very heavily? And, and the analogy I would give is like, how many people read the terms and conditions when they sign up for an online? So people are so quick to like, I'm using Facebook, I'm using Twitter, um, you know, I open up an app and do you realize that that app is, you know, you already agreed to collect your location data, that location data is, is available, it can be sold and aggregated and, you know, yes, you know, maybe it's anonymized, but the amount of information you're just bleeding from your cell phone that you don't give a second thought about um, is one thing, but then when it comes, I think, to municipalities, at least what I've seen um, with my fellow practitioners is there's like an uber focus on understanding some of this information, and especially when you're dealing with with third parties. So it's things like understanding, you know, who owns the data, how is the data accessed, how is the data retained, where is the data stored. What does it mean? Like, what are we collecting? How long is the retention? You know, is it anonymized? Is it anonymized after a certain period? So those are types of things that do come up in regular both IT procurement and technology uh, procurement. And I do think there is a higher standard uh, on, uh, you know, say, our, at least on a municipal level than maybe what people even put on their own, their own self, right? And I'll give you just one brief example to illustrate it. You know, we we offer services as a city, you know, you can book parks or other facilities for, um, say, wedding events or things like that, you know, big discussion happened around, well, should we enable, you know, Facebook tracking cookies, because now we're providing data to a third party company, even if it means that we could follow up with someone and say, you know, we noticed that you had inquired about this, you know, if, if that was a public company, there'd be no discussion, it would be part of your sales channel for us to figure out how to optimize and uh, you know, retain or secure that business. But when you're in municipality, you go, nope, we'll just, we're not going to turn on that functionality. We refuse to use it because of the fact that it's going to be a data collection for a third party that we don't have control over, even if we put disclaimers on the site, right? And then you look at open data and you go, here's a complete opposite where it's about maturing a city's ability as custodians of 
of our of data, whether it be businesses or our community or our residents, and how can we ensure that that there's transparency and availability of that data through open data portals. And then when you do put information on open data portals, for example, it's been vetted through legal and privacy to make sure that there are no privacy and, and uh, implications. And it gets very subtle. Like, you know, I can give another example. We were looking at analyzing data that's available through our Vision Zero dashboard, right? You know, everyone says good cause, understanding, you know, pedestrian and cyclist collisions and, and fatalities. You know, but it goes down to the microscopic level of saying, you know, is there any level of data that we have that could then theoretically be tied back to some other incident to match a piece of data around a collision or something like that? Or what does that mean for, you know, for traffic cameras and things like that? So I, I do think there is maturity and I do think there's work to be done. You know, our cities, you know, does everybody have a mature enterprise data management solution? You know, probably not. Does everybody have a chief privacy officer? Does everybody have a chief data officer? No, these are these are evolving areas in municipal um, space, maybe more so at the, at the federal, I can't speak to the federal and provincial level, but I do think there is, so to answer your question in a long-winded manner, um, there is an understanding. It may not be perfect, but it is front and center because there is that duty um, to kind of protect and act as that custodian in a higher value worth or you know higher scrutiny as a public entity than private corporations or even what people put on themselves. Excellent, thank you. Uh, appreciate that. Um, I uh, just wanted to turn to uh, Merlin quickly, if you don't mind. I um, I was curious about sort of uh, extending this a little bit to just to a discussion about where the provincial and federal governments may sort of fit into this. Um, again, this is a, a a fast moving, highly complex, and fairly technical policy space. But should we we be focusing on creating more robust national and provincial data standards or guidelines that could assist municipal governments? What, where might other orders of government really fit into this uh, picture? Yeah, I mean, I, I think robust standards and guidelines are are necessary. Um, but to be honest, I I don't really have the confidence that federal and provincial governments are, are the ones to do it well. Uh, and I don't even necessarily mean uh, mean the outcome. I, I mean, specifically, I don't see it being done well in the process, right? Like, uh, in order to, to do, I mean, let's look at health even now, right? And, and the interaction between health data at the provincial and federal level reporting in uh, health regions from the provincial level and and provincially at the federal level like you know i think there's there's room for federal and provincial to get their own uh data standardization done better and properly in, in a way that would then benefit municipalities um for for municipal i would prefer to see some type of national network where there's a sort of co-creation of what that would look like um recognizing that uh being within the the sort of jurisdiction of provinces, there, there may not be uh, that ability to have a, a nation, nationwide one. Um, but I, I think that though that would be a, a longer term project, um, that's gonna lead to something that's actually doable uh, and sustainable. I think we've seen too many times that, you know, whatever standards or, or things that are imposed from the top down uh, don't come with the necessary resources to to actually implement it properly. And the the other thing that I would say when we're talking about orders of government is is that we we can't lose focus on the interaction of indigenous communities, indigenous nations, um, and and data sovereignty. And that's you know municipal level, uh, provincial level, federal level. There there's history uh, uh, and ongoing history of, of abuses of indigenous data and uh, ownership issues and and i think that um cities have a, a real opportunity to to start to recognize and to to make changes in the way that that interaction occurs uh, obviously they don't, they're not in complete control of it um but i think yeah when, when we're looking at uh data standards across orders of government that that is one area uh, that can't be left out. 
Excellent. Thank you, Merlin. Appreciate that. Um, so I think I could probably pose questions to all of you for uh, a long time, but I noticed that um, we are getting short on time and we have a ton of questions from the audience and they are some really great questions. So I think if it's okay with you guys, I will uh, turn our attention to those questions. And um, there's a really good one uh, here for Natasha uh, from, from uh, Thomas. And he asks, does the increasing interconnection between smart city data collection and digital data collection in policing affect how you think about smart city policy development? If so, how? Yeah, this is a, a really interesting question. And I think it's something we have to be really thoughtful about. Um, certainly law enforcement wants more data. Law enforcement would make uh, arguments that you know they should have access to more data, full disclosure. I worked for the RCMP for 10 years as a civilian analyst. So I'm very familiar with those arguments. I think also we have to be um, a little critical about what kind of data law enforcement should get. We have uh, deep structural problems with law enforcement globally, and we have those, those problems here in Canada. And I think the Clearview AI case where we had law enforcement agencies in Canada kind of beta testing this facial recognition technology without any kind of official sanction, without any kind of privacy assessments, really shows how, how law enforcement agencies can get themselves into trouble using data collection or data technologies that are really problematic. So I think this is something that municipalities and the provincial and federal level, along with privacy commissioners, have to think about really carefully because there's going to be this tendency to want all the data and not manage it in uh, effective or proper ways and un unfairly um, exacerbate existing discriminatory policies. Just if That's I could, a, oh, oh, sorry. If I, sorry, if I can just add on that, I think, yeah, I agree completely. I think um, what's interesting for us, you know, we use this framework of the open smart city uh, and, and around that's in, including sort of transparency and accountability and procurement and, and how things are being used and how data is being shared. And, and we see a lot of uptake at the municipal level, right? Uh, and at the provincial level, there's, you know, there's always, um, discussions about transparency and being transparent, the, the province of Ontario with their uh, transparent AI commitment to the open government partnership, but, but that never sort of uh, includes discussion on how it doesn't include provincially funded police and municipal funded police. So there, there's this segmenting of these commitments to transparency that don't include law enforcement, um, which I, I think is sort of indicative of the problem. Excellent, thank you, Marilyn, appreciate that. Um, I have a really good question here from uh, Kirk that I think uh, Cyrus and Marilyn may be well, well placed to answer. And I'm, I'm gonna go to uh, Cyrus first. Um, but Kirk was, was, was basically asking here about sort of monitoring evaluation and the demonstration of public value. So he asked, um, how do we measure the value of the, of the, of the technologies and demonstrate how they enhance municipal service delivery. Um, Cyrus, would you want to tackle that one first? Yeah, sure. I think that's a great question by Kirk. And I think that's the, a, a large problem around smart city. Like it's really, people kind of have an understanding of what it is. Um, but if you look at it just from like a vendor, big tech technology vacuum perspective, you know, it's, it's hard to explain that ROI on it. So I would say, you know, when you look at smart things that I would consider smart, city type solutions and i'll give you know articulate some like for example um you know is expanding wi-fi into uh parks uh a good in terms of place making to make access more equitable right that would be something where you know what's it's sometimes difficult to measure the roi on that but we know there are segments of the population that are affected by the digital divide and if you can make opportunities to get connected you know people think about libraries right if there are technologies available to the library you know, if you're lending out iPads to people because, and with data connections because they don't have access to technology at home, you know, I would argue that's a component of being a smart city and a smart and an open city. So, you know, as it compares to, for example, let's look at big thorny issues like GHG or, you know, GHG reductions, net zero and, and homelessness. 
can we use data to better understand, you know, for example, the workflows or like the demand on the system for uh, homeless supports? Can we use, which the city owns and isn't contracted out to a third party? You know, let's think about, let's go to IoT example. Can we use IoT sensors to monitor building technologies such that we can actually optimize um, within a, a fleet of buildings their, you know, consumption of energy to reduce our GHG uh, redu targets? Can we use, you know, air quality IoT sensors um, to really understand the hyperlocal uh, air quality conditions and what might help policies or, or procedures or practices that can improve those things. So um, to his point, I think, you know, when you, if, if you're talking about spend, you know, you got to think about those priorities, but there are ways to think about using technology to support those big thorny issues or societal issues that I would consider smart um, and not necessarily the all encompassing you know, massive data collection and, um, you know, AI vision recognition and, and tracking people and those types of technology. So I, I think you've got to put it in the context of how are you using technology to solve big thorny problems or even so solving small problems in a privacy centric manner. Um, and if you're achieving sort of benefit for the citizens and residents, uh, you know, compared to all the challenges you have, then there is that the ROI, but I will profess that articulating it and being able to put a dollar value associated with some of these technologies is um, difficult. And I can speak to one, you know, we're using uh, an AI IoT based technology that's very privacy centric. So it does all redaction, you can't see anything like entire vehicles, faces, you can't even see what type of car it is. It just takes images, but it gives us waste information. So we can now see participation rates of recycling bins um, and, and garbage rate participation. So from a privacy perspective, there, there's no PI or anything being collected. The cost to the city to manually have someone with a clipboard go and target that information for a neighborhood to know if we need to send them maybe, you know, for example, flyers around, you know, how to, uh, what goes into recycling or, or things like that isn't is cost prohibitive. So it becomes really challenging, but you've got to still do it in that context of protecting resident privacy, being super cautious around what is why if you even need to collect PI and putting it in the greater context of how do you implement something that solves a problem uh, more effectively, more efficiently, so that you can then use your tax dollars to fund other programs potentially where there might be uh, deficits. Awesome, thank you. Um, we have a, a, a couple questions here around um, sharing or releasing data to, to private, Entities, Ash and Marion here, uh, we have really, really excellent questions. And um, when when you were kind of, and I think probably uh, Merlin, you may be really well placed to answer some of this stuff if 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 you don't mind if I go to you first. But um, when, when we're sort of sharing data with with private firms, uh, do we need to be sort of fully anonymized? And Marion asks uh, if you if we have an example of successful or innovative public-private data governance models? Is there something here that has worked well in the past, something that we can kind of point to as, as being successful, or is it something that we're still trying to work through a bit? Yeah, I mean, it sort of relates back to, to the last question of what is success and, and how do you evaluate for success? Um, I think the uh, public-private um, within Canada at least, and, and Natasha may have a better perspective on this historically, um, I think it's still in, in a fairly liminal space. Um, you know, I think there's been examples of, of um, uh, private to public sharing, uh, and we've seen that around like globally more so than Canada, but uh, telecoms and, and providing uh, mobility data based on, on the location um, that I think have been really beneficial. Um, I, you know, as far as the answering a specific question on um, whether it needs to be anonymized, um, it really depends on on the the, the data, the the population, the um, telecom provider, the the private organization. You know, like uh, trying to to anonymize your way out of uh, privacy and security issues with with Facebook is is probably. Um, uh, not really worth the effort, you know? Um, so, but I, you know, I think that there's, there's, there's room for like public to public sharing that, 
that is probably, you know, would, would have more, uh, um, realization of benefits. Um, so interjurisdictional data sharing, um, and, and sharing between organizations that are, again, helping to address these specific problems, um, figuring out how to properly share data between orders of government. Um, I think all of these ha have sort of a, a more accessible return on investment uh, with less risk than, than trying to get to a whole lot of sharing between public and private. Again, if it's, if it's uh, orders of government accessing private data or, or data from the private sector, I'm, I'm more for that than, than the actual sharing of the other way. Um, there's, you know, the, the, for me, the risks outweigh the benefits. Excellent, thank you. Um, so we have a couple of minutes left and uh, tons of really great questions, but I want to pose this one uh, to Natasha very, very quickly. This is from, from Vanessa. Uh, she says, you mentioned social innovation and IP. How would you define social innovation and in what ways is IP interfering with the capacity for social innovation to take place through data platforms? What are some, some ways around this interference? There's a lot there, of course, but I was curious if, if that's something that you wanna kinda look at quickly. Yeah, this is, this is a huge question. And, and thinking of it in terms of the Keyside discussion, there was a lot of concern that local tech companies, local entrepreneurs, local civic groups, community groups would be shut out of using the data. And this is because at the, at the beginning, Sidewalk Labs wanted to grab all that data to be able to uh, use intellectual property to kind of lock it down. And then others would have to you know, have licenses to be able to access it. So broadly thinking about social innovation would be you know, an alternative to strictly um, you know, uh, a monopolization of data, right? And locking that down through intellectual property. So one thing we could think about is patent pools, right? So pools of patents that were available for all different types of actors to be able to use that technology. This does go against uh, a kind of a strong imperative by companies, especially the big tech companies who their main goal is to establish intellectual property to be able to lock others out and create rent by having others pay them to use their technology or pay to access their data. So it does involve a little bit of a mind shift and also pushing back against this, you know, this, this specific type of data-driven capitalism. Excellent, thank you so much. And um, I think this is a really great question to sort of um, end things off today. Uh, Navina asks, um, how can cities best identify problems that data can solve? So um, I think this is, is kind of a question about being strategic about where we are using data. Um, is it all problems or, or is it just certain certain types of problems? And um, uh, Cyrus, do you mind if we went to you first? But I thought um, everyone on the panel may have some, some final concluding thoughts on this. But uh, Cyrus, do you want to go first? Yeah, I think, you know, if data can be used to help drive decisions that solve uh, problems or allow for enhanced service delivery or help inform, you know, investment, you know, I think it's those, and again, those are really motherhood statements, right? But I think that's where the, the power is, is really looking at that the data that's available or finding new ways of collecting data, you know, in a privacy centric manner, right. With that, you know, disqualify uh, qualifier on it there um, that help, you know, drive, you know, if you think about infrastructure, right. Like really understanding um, infrastructure assets uh, to help guide, you know, capital investment plans. If you think about, again, the GHG problems, or if you think about addressing health issues or socioeconomic challenges, you know, can you use data to put in, you know, practices and policies that move the needle on those things that are important to citizens and the community. Um, I think that's that's good. I think where it gets tricky and there's you know, a lot of red flags is around understanding like monetization of data just for the sake of monetizing it or, you know, collecting data without any real understanding of how the data is going to be used and control and access to the data. So yeah, I, I do think there's, you got to find that balance across the spectrum, um, but definitely there's there's lots and lots of opportunities um, that are for, you know, I don't use a cliche firm of, of using data for good, but if you can kind of keep that mantra in mind and, and how the benefits you get out of it, then there's lots of value. 
Excellent, thanks. Um, Merlin, Natasha, any, any final thoughts on this? Yeah, I'll just, I mean, the, the question is phrased in a way that I would start to answer it and, and reflecting on, on what Cyrus said is that um, it, when it's problem driven, right? And, and it's definitely an organizational bias is that we'll start, we start with a problem driven approach. Whereas often what we're seeing is the tech driven or the, the opportunity driven. So we have an opportunity to collect all of this data. Let's find a problem that we can pretend to solve, right? But if you're actually starting with the problem uh, and, and figuring out what data that you have that can help address and, and improve your decision-making to solve that problem, and then where your data deficits are, then you're looking for data collection methods that are directly related to a problem and, and solving that problem instead of, you know, I don't think uh, there's any lack of data in municipalities, but it's the, the lack of the, the right data and the data that is um, focused on improving decisions and, and policy and, and solving really tangible challenges. Excellent, thank you. Um, maybe as a final word, Natasha, any thoughts on this, on this question before we throw it back to uh, Enid? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question, and I, I wholeheartedly agree with Merlin. The only thing I would say, too, is often when we're presented with uh, these data-driven uh, answers to problems like uh, Uber is the answer to public transit woes, we forget about the public infrastructure, right? And we forget about the decades and hundreds of years we've spent up building public infrastructure and public expertise, and it suddenly becomes uh, an answer where private sector is involved often forgetting about that, uh, that really important uh, role of public infrastructure. And they, they, they build the solution on top of unacknowledged public infrastructure in a way that, that benefits uh, private interests. So I think it's bringing it back to, again, what is the problem? And two, how does that fit in with what already works in terms of public responses to these problems? Excellent. Um, thank, thanks so much. So I just wanted to um, apologize to everyone who has asked the question. I'm sorry that we can't get to everything. I think this uh, clearly demonstrates that there is um, a lot of interest in this and then just how, how critical of a, of a policy space this, this really is. So I hope that we've made a bit of, bit of headway in answering some of those uh, questions and providing a bit of insight today. Uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us and I want to throw it back to uh, back to Enid for just a couple of concluding thoughts today. Thanks again to our to our fantastic panel. Well, thank you very much. And you're quite right, Zach. There are lots of questions, which shows that there's a lot of interest in this topic. And uh, for the audience, we will pass these questions on uh, to the panel so they will see them. Um, it was a fascinating session. Uh, I mean, we, we're all concerned about data. It, it, it's fantastic to improve services like Cyrus talked about, but there are issues around privacy and ownership and IP and all the things we talked about this morning. Um, so that was a great discussion. Um, I would like to thank Merlin, Cyrus and Natasha for being on the panel today and Zach for moderating it and, and curating the questions. Um, today's event has been recorded um, and will be available on our website in a few days. Um, and as Zach mentioned at the beginning, the previous event in this series on the municipalities and the platform economy is um, already on our website, so you can, you can look at that. So thank you very much, everyone, uh, for coming today and have a great afternoon.